Hi, Bruce. I'm going to go ahead and check your microphone now. I'm going to unmute you. Guys, you'll please let me know that you can hear me. I can hear you. Can you hear me, Aubrey? I can. Thank you. Perfect. How's the how's the video? Can you see my video or not? Um, we can't see your video until you are in a panelist position. Okay. No, that's fine. Just checking. Okay. Everybody does Thanks. these differently, and I uh, always make sure, as I say, I make sure the tech works. So. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Hey, Aubrey, are, can you hear me? This is Wayne. Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay. You want to uh, turn me over to host at any point, feel free. Or you can keep the host. That's perfectly fine, too. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. You, you know, wait, wait, go ahead and go ahead and keep it. Okay. And I have gone ahead and started the recording. Perfect. You'll be running these all by yourself. Where's all the rest of our people, Audrey? Aubrey, sorry. I, Aubrey. I do not know. I resent out the invitation, so we should see. Oh, it looks like Dave just um, yeah, there's the connected. But we've just got Bruce on the attendees list. Oh, but I Matt. sent out. The, everybody got the links. <laughs> oh, Matt. Yeah, Matt just joined us. So we're, we're good. Okay. Hey, guys. Hi there. Hi, Matt. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes. I can't hear you. Somebody say something. You can't hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. I'm in good shape. Thanks. Jay, Craig, I see you just um, joined the meeting. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and make sure your microphone is working. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, I can hear you just fine. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Amanda Green, I'm going to unmute you if you can please reply. You're unmuted. I'm here. Okay, thank you.
Amanda, um, I don't know why, but for some reason, I don't have a camera button on my WebEx. That's a good the, thing for all of us, isn't it? It probably is, but <laughs> to the extent that you want to make sure that I'm not actually doing this from you know, like a tropical island or a jail cell. Um, I'm looking at the settings and I don't. It's really weird. Paul, you might want to log out and like, maybe yeah, yeah try it comes back in. All right, give me a second. Aubrey, I'm seeing it's three o'clock. Does it look like we have representatives from? We are waiting for Paul to get back into the meeting. Okay, um, great. He was having some issues with his WebEx. Okay, great. So once he joins, we should be ready to go. Yeah. Thank you. Paul said he's listed as an attendee on Teams. He mentioned that. Wayne, you're going to have to move him over. Yeah, Paul, I just moved you over. Thank you. It gives me a video option now. I don't know what the issue was before. We don't see you on video. It's because I didn't bless you with my vision yet. <laughs> ah. There's your beautiful face. Thank you. <laughs> okay, it looks like uh, uh, I believe uh, we're all here and, and ready to go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, appeals hearing for Salt Lake City. My name is Matt Worth, one of the city's appeal officers. And the only agenda item we have on this afternoon's appeals hearing is for PLN APP 2021-007. Yes, I've seen the new movie, but we're going to say 00776 is the number. This is a, an appeal of the Planning Commission decision to approve a design review application for the 150 South Main Street apartments. And uh, so before, as you all know, the city uh, raised initially the standing uh, issue for uh, with respect to the appellants. And uh, I received both uh, statements from Mr. Nielsen, city attorney, as well as the appellants, as well as uh, Hines, the applicant, uh, at least their uh, legal representatives. And so we need to uh, address that matter 
uh, before getting to the merits of the appeal. And so I do have and, and have uh, studied the materials uh, submitted from the various parties, but would like to uh, uh, on this issue uh, give uh, the parties an opportunity just to um, uh, speak to that issue um, and either uh, if they have anything to add, what wasn't in their brief, you don't need to necessarily rehash any specifics, but if you'd like to highlight anything from those arguments, that would be welcome and appreciated. If, uh, and so why don't we, uh, uh, let, let the appellant speak to that and appellant's representatives, at least speak to that, uh, issue if they so, uh, wish to, is, is there someone, did I hear that Craig Smith is on? Craig, are you, uh, wanting to uh, chime in on that issue in addition to what was submitted? Yeah, I'd be happy to, and thank you for the opportunity. Should I just go ahead now? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, let me, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the standing question or the, I think that relates back to, uh, whether appellants are adversely affected. And there's a definition of that in 10, nine, a dash. 1032 and, uh, when that issue was first brought to us, and by the way, it's interesting that uh, the city doesn't even bother to put the adversely affected information on their form that people use to appeal. Um, I guess they're supposed to just know about standing and the closest thing they have is what is your interest? That's not exactly why you're adversely affected or why you should have a right to appeal. So, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting how interested the city is now in standing when they don't even bother to have people mark on the, their very own appeal form what their standing is or what they're adversely affected, how they're adversely affected. But nonetheless, we meet the requirements for standing. Now, I know there's been a lot of uh, interest in the McKittrick case, and it's an interesting case, and I think it's a helpful case, but I'm gonna suggest to uh, this body that there is a more on-point case that was decided by the Utah Supreme Court in 2010 and that case is Mora versus Grand County that went to the Supreme Court on the issue of standing. And I know a little bit about that case because I handled that case. Uh, that was my case. Uh, and I had uh, Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. Budge very, and Mr. Brewer all against me. They were very able and did a great job in that case. But that was where they raised standing. And in that case, which is ad addressed in a footnote in the McKittrick case, so it's not like the Supreme Court's forgotten about it. In that, in the Mora case, uh, uh, you know, the question was at that time, there was not a definition of what adversely affected was, but you still had to be an adversely affected party to participate in the land use appeal. And that case is a land use case. And that's why I think it's a little more on point than McKittrick, which is a grandma case. And in, in McKittrick being a grandma case, it, it's clearly there isn't any, any statutory standing for uh, Mr. Kerry Gibson, who was trying to appeal. And in, in this case, in the Mora case, and as, as they as they addressed it also in the McKittrick case, what the uh, uh, Utah Supreme Court said as well, you know, if you adversely affected is pretty much just coextensive with the language of, of traditional standing, so they treat it as traditional standing. I think that's still the case. I don't think anything's changed. I don't think McKittrick says is, is you know, so I think you can use the same analysis as traditional standing because they're coextensive, just like the Utah Supreme Court said in McKittrick, traditional standing and, and in this case, not in McKittrick, that's different. They have a different language, but in but in this in the land use statute here in the definitions of in LUDMA, we have the uh, we have you know pretty much the same definition. Now it wasn't defined then, but it's still adversely affected. And you know, obviously now there's a little more contours to it. So that being said, you know, when we were asked, you know, there's been uh, points raised, well, it's too late, you can't raise the standing. Well, you can't address this now. I, you know, you can raise standing at any time and they raised it and we're addressing it. I don't think it's, there's any rule that says you have to address it on their, their form that says nothing about standing or nothing about being adversely affected. But when it was raised, we've addressed it. And we have people who actually work there and will lose their place of work. 
Now, if that's not a if that's not a palpable or distinct injury that's different from the general public, I don't know what is. I wouldn't like to have my building torn down that I work in and have to relocate, or my business lose my business lease and lose where I. Do. And it, it, somehow there's some hint that because of some of these people rent from the redevelopment agency that they are somehow less than real people that they can't raise this because they're the tenants and you know that's a pretty high hat and to use a very old term sort of way of approaching this these people will lose their place of business or lose their employment they'll have to go find another place of business or another job that's a real and palpable injury and we didn't have just one or two of these we have seven or eight of these people that that are in this situation so you know i think there's been a lot of uh, uh, vinegar and whatever put into the standing question. I think it's all for the not because we have people who have standing. Look at the Mora case. In the Mora case, their standing was they were concerned about water impacts of this development, not what the development looked like, not how big it was. And that's another thing that I think is is lost on us, uh, has been lost in this debate about standing is it doesn't matter what your motivations are. You don't have a different motivation if you have one reason to oppose it. People who oppose and adversely affected parties who oppose a development can have any motivation or reason they want. And the fact is, whether they like a theater or not, or they don't like tall buildings, that doesn't make any difference. They're trying to parse the standing here and say, well, this really doesn't affect what you're concerned about. Well, it doesn't matter what they're concerned about. That comes later. Well, then, as soon as you showed up later, the next thing you'd be hearing is, Oh, you should have raised this issue long before. There were, you know, if you were to look at this strictly speaking, nobody's adversely affected by a new development until the new development is built. So that would mean that nobody has any standing because they're just not, no adverse effect until the, the building permits issue and construction starts. Well, we all know that that's not when you challenge and under our code for land use, that's not when the challenge is made. The challenge is made as you go along every is part of a continuous process and to try to parse this the way I, I think it's it's been suggested in some of the briefing that's just totally wrong thank you that's my my two cents on standing thanks Craig let me if, if I can let me just ask you um, a couple of follow-up questions with re respect just to make sure I understand so with respect to the parsing I, I don't want to put words in your mouth um, uh, the, the parsing are you talking about? And this is one of the things I'd like you to address a, a little more detail if you, if you could. The issue of uh, one of the issues that brought up the fact that the land use decision at issue isn't the issue of, of demolition. This is just uh, you know a design review that allowed a, a higher building to be made. Is that? a little bit of what you mean on the parsing out yeah. between this is all one continuous process kind of thing is that exactly i think you'd be making a big mistake if you bought this argument this what i call the parsing argument because what you're doing is looking behind to the motivations of why people who have standing oppose this and what's interesting is in all the briefing they say well you know the, whether the pantasia theater gets destroyed or not is irrelevant to this decision and then in the, next, in the next breath in, in the briefing we see, and then they go into long reasons why it's a piece of crap and it should be, but we didn't go there. We didn't make those arguments. Our arguments are, is simply this. Um, if I oppose a project and I have standing, I can oppose it at any stage of the project. I don't have to wait till, you know, maybe I don't like, you know, the color of the, the I mean, you could have a million reasons if you have standing to oppose it project. That's why we have the public process. That's irrelevant. What's relevant is every decision that's made in that is a decision that's going to move towards what you don't want to see happen, what you don't want to see occur, and and then you're against. And so this idea that it can be parsed out, that would, like I say, out of the next breath, you'd say you showed up and let's say we just didn't show up at this hearing and then we came and opposed it somewhere else. You'd say, well, no, the decision's already been made, guys. You missed your chance. We had a public hearing. You didn't come. You didn't appeal. You're done. And I guess, like I say, if you buy the argument of the city on this, it wouldn't be until the demolition permit is issued that we would have any standing. How much opportunity to oppose that at that point would we have? Well, I've looked at the code, none. One other follow-up, thank you, 
Craig, is this issue of ownership. Um, and, it, you know, in the brief, uh, the, the language seems to be that will, with respect to ownership, does mention owns real property. And then there's the second one, if they'll, they'll suffer some damage that's different than, than the rest of the community. Yeah. Uh, but the, it, the, it's mentioned that they own or employed in a business, but clearly is not ownership of real estate. Can you just help again, help me focus on uh, uh, does ownership of real estate matter uh, or, or, or not? Well, that's, there are two ways you could have standing. One is through ownership of real estate. And if you're adjoining owners, usually you're going to have maybe one or two adjoining owners would that be only people would have standing under the ownership because you know, I, I guess you could argue that across the street is adjoining, but I it probably is not or two two way. So it's it, that's pretty narrowly drawn, and it's an either or. Or you have, you know, we do have some rights for the people that don't own downtown real estate in this state, and one of that is, or you have a damage will suffer a damage different and distinct from injury from the general community. Okay, and it's so. So your argument is not that 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 uh, the appellants necessarily own property. It is based based on sort of the the, the last uh, I mean, catch they, all. They yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, let let let's see. I don't know if 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 the city or the uh, uh, applicant. Uh, I see. Uh, Mr. Baird's on or Mr. Nilsson, if, if either of you want to address, you're both certainly welcome to um, ad address any of this uh, now. Yeah, um, Matt, I, I would like to. Sorry, Mr. Worthland. Um, Paul Nielsen, Salt Lake City Attorney's Office, representing the city. Um, uh, I don't think I could disagree with more than what I just heard. Um, first of all, I want to point out that uh counsel for the uh, appellants in their response to the, the standing question have added a bunch of appellants which is impermissible the opportunity to identify appellants in this matter was within that 10-day uh, window of appealing the planning commission decision um, so to add a whole bunch of new people is impermissible um, notwithstanding that um there are eight words that I want you to focus on from Utah Code Section 109A-103, uh, Sub 2. And that is, as a result of the land use decision. Um, this, is, this is the definition of who is an adversely affected party. Uh, and those are the critical words, but it is, as you noted, somebody who owns real estate that is abutting or someone who will suffer damage different in kind than or an injury distinct from that of the general community as a result of the land use decision. So we are talking about the land use decision. What the planning commission had authority to decide upon here was design review. They did not have authority to determine whether demolition was appropriate. And despite Mr. Smith's uh, clever parsing argument, there actually is a specific land use application for demolition. And despite the fact that he says that they have virtually no opportunity to appeal that, there's a case, Fox versus Park City, that is on point, which talks about uh, specifically when you may appeal a land use decision, and particularly in cases when you don't have specific notice. And that was like a demolition permit. It was uh, a construction permit that they wouldn't necessarily get individualized notice of. Um, as a result of the land use decision, okay, we can't appeal something that the planning commission didn't authorize. You can only appeal something they did. And when you look at the appellant's uh, response on standing, you see the argument. A second here. This is on at the top of page three. Obviously, those who may be displaced. 
from either their business or place of employment will suffer damage different in kind than or an injury distinct from that of the general community as a result of the land use decision. The land use decision, Mr. Worthland, does not displace anybody. Now, let's be clear about that. The current property owner is the redevelopment of, uh, agency. Um, they could have applied for demolition long, long ago, long before this design review application come, came in. They could apply for demolition today or tomorrow. And that is a separate application from design review. The design review allows an applicant to uh, have some flexibility from the general code requirements, but it could either be Heinz or it could be the redevelopment agency could submit an application right now. Well, Heinz could when they own it, they could submit an application to demolish the structure and build up to 100 feet without design review. That's why it's very, very important to focus on those eight words as a result of the land use decision. The land use decision here was not demolition because the planning commission cannot authorize that. Um, I think it's interesting uh, that Mr. Smith said that he thinks that there's a more on point case than McKittrick, which is still very, very fresh. Um, he thinks that Mora is a more appropriate case to look at than McKittrick. And I'll tell you why that's not true. If you look at footnote 13 in McKittrick, or if you have the luxury of having access to Westlaw, you will see that Westlaw says distinguished, when you look at Mora, it says distinguished by McKittrick versus Gibson. And here's why in footnote 13. Gibson cites National Parks and Conservation Association versus Board of State Lands, Utah chapter of the Sierra Club versus Air Quality Board, and Mora versus Grand County for the proposition that Utah case law shows a wide variety of circumstances under which traditional standing has been granted despite a statutory limitation. But in National Parks and Sierra Club, we look solely at whether petitioners had constitutional standing under, under the traditional and or alternative tests. Um, and Mora, like Cedar Mountain, addressed a statutory right found, uh, review that we found equivalent in scope to our traditional judicial test for standing. We've acknowledged here that that part B of 103.2 is essentially traditional standing. I don't know why we would uh, resort to Mora, uh, other than the fact that it's very clear in McKittrick that there is no alternative standing. And I believe Mr. Smith wants his clients, the friends of the theater, to be able to remain in this case, which is not possible under McKittrick. The Supreme Court made it very clear they do not have authority. Now, let's, let's take a moment to think of the farce that is the argument that um, uh, they have traditional standing, that the Friends of the Theater uh, and the other entity um, related to the theater have traditional standing because they're prospective buyers of the property. Well, if that's true, Mr. Worthland, I'm a prospective buyer of the property too, because I would like to buy and build on that site, as are you, as are all of us here, except for the fact that the RDA is negotiating with Heinz Acquisition to purchase the property and not with the friends of the Pantages Theater. Uh, it, it, it is a ridiculous argument. I can't believe I just wasted the time talking about it. Go, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just want to, um, I can't read it. Uh, Bruce Baird was not able to unmute himself, so I just unmuted Bruce now, and I guess we'll have to keep him unmuted. Bruce, you're unmuted now. Thank you very much, Mr. Wills, and I will wait until it's my turn to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to know, it's also interesting in the response uh, that the appellants provided to the argument that McKittrick here uh, extinguishes any alternative standing right, they go ahead and argue alternative standing anyways. Um, I don't know what was that was unclear to the appellants about McKittrick, but there is no alternative standing. So let's let's not go there. Um,
Mr. Smith argued that we should have included a standing standard on our appeal form. Um, I, I would hope that he's aware of the standards, but uh, that's certainly something for the city to consider in the future. And we can talk with staff about uh, putting something on the form. Um, let me just say this, this final piece um, about what potential rights somebody may have. Uh, who can claim that they are an adversely infected party? And in this case, again, the eight words, um, which are important, uh, related to this particular land use application, and I forgot my eight words, as a result of the land use decision. Um, the rights that a tenant has are prescribed by the terms of the lease. Uh, if, if there's an argument here that the property owner has no rights or, or they're limited in their rights to demolish because it could harm or somehow impact um, a tenant's business, I would think that that is a whole new statutory or whole new principle that we're inventing here. Um, when we have uh, the law of contract, that binds a tenant to what's in their lease. They don't have any more rights than that. And an employee of a business that is a tenant has no rights in real estate. They have no rights in that real estate. I would like to note that although we had uh, some new appellants added to this matter, one of those appellants works in the Kearns building, which is not going to be impacted by this. Um, so I, and, and I guess I want to be careful here, but uh, there's no indication in any of the briefs, uh, that council, um, actually is representing any of these so-called appellants. There's nothing that they've submitted that says attorneys for appellants. And I, I have, you know, I don't know whether these folks actually have consented to put their names uh, in this uh, appeal material uh, beyond a few individuals that we know uh, are leading uh, an effort with respect to the, the Pantages Theater. Um, you know, that being said, uh, the new appellants are impermissible to, to add to this matter. Um, they've acknowledged that there are many who actually are in no different position than the community in general. And the only people who they have uh, alluded to, but have not specifically identified um, are business owners and employees. And as I mentioned, the tenants have the rights that are granted to them pursuant to the terms of the lease that they entered into. And their employees in uh, an at-will employment state do not have the right uh, to dictate how the real estate is used. Um, if you don't have any questions for me, I'm, I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, looks like, uh, Bruce, you're up. Thank you, Mr. M Mr. Worthman. Uh, there's a simple answer why Mora isn't applicable and McKittrick is. And that simple answer is because some of us didn't like in the land use task force, uh, didn't think that it was appropriate to have goody two shoes gadflies have standing. I apologize, I don't know why my camera isn't working, but we, some of us thought that it was inappropriate in the land use task force to have goody two shoes with no actual impact, um, have absolute standing under Mora. So we changed the law and the statute now reads as it reads, which requires a distinct injury. Therefore, McKittrick is 100% controlling because there is a statutory standard and they don't meet the statutory standard in any way. And I'll go into that for a minute. Traditional standing or alternative standing doesn't exist. It's two standings and that's it. The owner or the applicant and the owner of a property next adjacent or somebody who has a distinct individualized interest injury. So these people are not the applicant. They're, that's one strike. They're not an adjacent owner. That's two strikes. The question is, for the third strike, do they have a distinct injury? They've alleged two different kinds of distinct injuries 
and I'm gonna take the dumbest one first. And the dumbest one is the two corporations claim that they want to be a prospective buyer of the theater. Well, there's two problems with that. One, the theater's already under contract, so they aren't a prospective buyer. And second, I was in New York last week and I walked over a bridge. These appellants, these corporate appellants have about as much chance of buying the Utah theater as they have of buying the Brooklyn Bridge. Just to say that they want to buy it in their wishes and hopes and fantasies for an LC with no assets, with an apartment as a registered address uh, formed three, four months ago is absurd and does not grant them standing. Now let's talk about the so-called individuals. Again, I don't wanna repeat what Mr. Nielsen said because he's done a very good job of it. But the simple fact is he's 100% right. There is no land use decision that has affected these people in any way whatsoever. Uh, there, we could build anything we want to. We could tear the, the RDA could tear the building down. We could tear the building down with a hundred foot building. It doesn't matter. This is 100% a subterfuge by um, frankly, partially demented people who have this fetish to preserve a theater that is beyond preservation, according to Judge Stone's decision, but it doesn't matter. This decision is two things and two things only, the height of the building and the setback. There is not a single word in any of the entire briefing or any of the comments, written or oral, as to how the height or the setback impacts these people in any way at all, much less how it impacts them in any way that's different from how those two things impact everybody in the city. And with that, I'll submit it on standing. This is, there's a reason the Supreme Court made the decision and there's a reason for standing and that is goody two shoes don't get to waste all of our time. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Baird. Uh, I, I am gonna give Craig is any opportunity for any brief uh, follow-up fi final word uh, on the on this issue? Uh, you're muted, Craig. I think. Let's see if we can get you. Uh, I'm happy to be a dumb and demented person. I've been a lot of things in my life, and I'm that today. And thank you, thank you, Mr. Baird, for that. I uh, I always expect that from you, and you never disappoint me. Thank you. Yeah, we made a written offer to buy the property. And I had the person who made the written offer right here. We'd be happy to talk about that. We didn't just want to buy the property. And I guess uh, I guess we're stupid because Mr. Baird knows what our assets are, and that's not even part of the case. Wow, we're just dumb people here and demented people here. We don't know. We can't read other people's minds. We can't look into other people's bank accounts. You know, that's that's the level we're on here. And that this has no effect. When do we get a chance to have standing? Yeah, nobody has standing in this case. Uh, it's just, this is, this is, it's just ridiculous to parse this. And, 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 and finally, I did something clever. Everything else I've done is really stupid, but this idea about them being able to parse this is ridiculous. It doesn't matter why we're against it. It, it doesn't matter. This is part of a step. If they will stipulate right now to build a hundred foot tall building, I will withdraw my appeal right now. That's all I need to hear. We know they're not going to build a hundred foot building, and this is an important cornerstone to their plan to build there, which we oppose because we're goody two shoots and we shouldn't have any rights. But and Mr. Barrett is now in charge of the legislature again. Wow, I wish I could tell the legislature what to do. I'm not that powerful. I just I'm just a simple person doing a simple job representing simple, straightforward clients. And I'm sorry, I'm wasting time of big and important inflated ego people who think that they're, you know what, and that, that God himself came down to anoint them to be the smartest people in the room and everything is black and white. And guess what? They're always right and we're always wrong. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing we have somebody that's that smart? They're not in the White House. They're not, you know, in charge of the biggest corporation. They're just another attorney here in town. Don't buy into this bombast. We have standing, and yeah, 
oh, this doesn't hurt us at all. Yeah, it does hurt. It doesn't say this has to be, again, can't parse it. You can't parse it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith. I, I recognize the emotions are uh, are very high on this. Uh, I appreciate the um, the work that everyone on all sides have have have, have put into this, and uh, hoping hoping we can keep things uh, relatively uh, civil. So I I, I I hope we can avoid any name calling uh, uh, going forward. Um, with respect to this standing issue, based on uh, the written materials received in our discussion this afternoon, and based on what I understand, uh, the uh, latest uh, on the law of standing with respect to this issue, I am uh, ruling that the appellants do not have standing in this particular appeal with respect to the planning commission decision on the design review application. And to that end, um, the merits of the appeal are, are moot. And so we will not need to go forward uh, with those issues. And uh, I will be issuing my written uh, decision uh, by Monday uh and uh that that's the decision of the appeals hearing officer on this preliminary issue so uh thank you uh everyone for again your your efforts and and your time and your input and uh, thank you for your time uh, this afternoon thank you thank mr you. worthland mr smith mr baird thank you mr worthland thank thanks everyone thank you bye Leave.